Ford. So good evening. Glad that you're here with us uh, for Thursday nights in Revelation. We are going to be in Revelation chapter eight tonight. Revelation chapter eight. We're going to start in verse one. I put that in the chat window. Just a quick note. Uh, pass the word along. We've had a little thing, a little cyber issue this week. Our website went down. Long story short, our web host had problems with the server. And so there, all the churches where they were hosting websites, every one of them crashed. And so they've been methodically, very slowly rebuilding all of the church's websites. So the, our church has our website up. The problem is it's not stocked with all the resources and links and photos and all those kind of things. So what I'm going to do is I will put the link to this session in our social media. I'll put it out via email and you can just spread the word. Anybody that misses this, uh, they can catch up that way. Okay. So with having said that, uh, we're just going to, we're going to press on. We're going to move forward. Revelation chapter eight. We're going to begin in verse one. I'm really excited about some of the things that we can cover tonight with this. So let's take a look and get into it. Verse one, John writes, when he, and he here is, is the Lord Jesus. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And so we're going to stop there. We're going to look a little bit cl more closely at the prelude to the seven trumpets. Now notice again in verse one, that, that this is actually the seventh seal. So we're at the final seal of the seven seal judgments that begin back in chapter six. But what's interesting here is to remember that the seventh seal leads up and the result of that is the presentation of the seven trumpet judgments. So notice this in verse one, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, what's significant about that is that if you go back and you read chapter 7, <clears throat> that place is noisy, isn't it? You have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of tribulation saints and angels and all of the rest who are in that room, and everybody's loud. It is deafening, if you could be deaf in heaven, but now suddenly there's silence for a half an hour. Now, does that mean that John got his watch out and started timing it? Probably not. The, the, the word there for half an hour is kind of a rare word, and it's really kind of an indetermined amount of time. It, it, it's, it's not exactly measured in our Western mind, but you get the idea of roughly half an hour. Was it 30 minutes? Maybe, maybe not. But you know, if you're in a room with a bunch of people and you're silent for 30 minutes, that seems like an eternity, doesn't it? You know, spending 30 minutes doing things is relative. If you're spending 30 minutes busy and working and doing something, 30 minutes goes by really fast. But if you're doing something very still and quiet for 30 minutes, and you're, there's no activity, and it's silent, 30 minutes is an awful long time, isn't it? So that's the idea. There was a very long, maybe even awkward period of silence in heaven. But notice now what John sees in verse 2. He says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. 
Now, it's kind of interesting that the word the is there. The seven angels. And notice they stand before God. Now, kind of interesting there. I don't think you read too much more into the seven angels, except to say that these are the seven angels who were given the specific assignment of sounding off the seven trumpets. So I think that's, that's it. But it's interesting when you look at how Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, is described in Luke 1, 19. If you look on the screen, I've got it popped up here. When, when Luke, or I mean, when, when Gabriel was speaking to um, Zacharias, the angel answered and said, said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. So where is, so, so Gabriel is known as an angel who stands in the presence of God. It's interesting to note that these seven angels are also seven angels who stand before God. So I guess we could get into a big discussion how many angels can stand before God. <laughs> can all of them? Uh, or are there specific angels that get a special role of standing before God and others don't? There's really no way to know. But it's interesting to note that these are seven angels, but they're given specific assignment to sound off these seven trumpets. Now, Jack ask a very a very interesting question what kind of a trumpet this was uh last week he asked if it was the shofar i don't know if you've ever heard of the shofar anybody familiar with that heard of that um, yeah. Yeah. okay i want to show you just real quickly I, I i went and found a picture of a shofar but i want to point out that we don't, that we don't know what kind of a what kind of a horn this was? The word that's used here can mean one of two horns. Okay, the first one is the shofar, and that's a picture of a shofar. It's kind of a broken off piece of a ram's horn. Okay, that's a shofar, but it also refers to a Roman trumpet that is long and skinny that looks like that that makes a really shrill high sound as opposed to the shofar that makes a really loud, low, rumbling kind of sound. So what kind of trumpet this was, we really don't know. Uh, scripture's not really clear because that word can refer to both. And we you know, there's, there's different historians that go back 2,000 years that say that that refer to it being like a Roman trumpet, and then others will say, no, 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 it's a shofar. And so there's two different opinions on it. And so the final answer is we're not really sure. Wouldn't it be if they were Israelites or if they were Romans would make the difference? Well, it, it depends on the context. I, you know, it, it, there was a the Jewish historian Josephus was the one that that said the trumpets here that were you the he, re, he reports trumpets referring to roman trumpets he's not talking he wasn't talking about a shofar and well, so i was he, thinking about when they blew the trumpets at uh, jericho yeah that's a totally different word though that was a shofar and and that was a hebrew word shofar means shofar but you're talking about a greek word that could refer to shofar or it could refer to a roman trumpet you follow what i'm saying yeah okay so it could refer to either one okay so they get these trumpets and now notice something else now we have another angel and this other this another angel has another assignment and this one has a golden censer now, the golden censer is that container that usually carries the incense, and that's what the, the priests would use to carry into the temple to the holy place to offer up the sacrifices. He would offer up the sacrifice along with the incense, and, and all of that would be offered up to God, and it would be a pleasing aroma, and that would be, make the sacrifice and the offering pleasing. But notice where what he's doing with this. He's given he, he comes with this censer and he can, comes and stands at the altar and notice what he gives. 
he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, I'm, I'm curious, and it's curious to note that he wasn't given just a little bit of incense, but he was given a lot of incense. And so you get the idea that because of the fact that he's giving, he's given more incense, it, it could very well be that he's carrying also a whole lot of prayers of the saints at the same time. And what's comforting for that is that every one of those prayers, God not only heard, but he kept and he preserved. And now he's about ready to act on them. It's fascinating to me. And I want to walk you through some of how that, that worked. I think the saints here, it seems that the saints here refer to the tribulation saints. And let me show you what I mean. If we go back to chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6, and we go back to the fifth seal, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's here on the screen if you want to look along too. Uh, he says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge the, our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So notice what they said. The content of their, of their prayer was what? They wanted to be avenged. They wanted, they wanted vengeance. Fires. They wanted to know specifically the answer to what question? Fires, Los Angeles. How long? How long? They wanted to know how long. How much mm -hmm. longer is this going to be? So, so it's interesting to note that that prayer of how much longer is this going to be is one that God hears. Isn't that interesting to note? And notice the response. A white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, work was completed. So he's, they're told to wait. So here, the specific answer to their prayer is, you got to wait. The time Do you have any right. idea how many we were talking about here? No, have no idea. No. We have no idea. But they're told to wait. Now, we come up here to Revelation 8 and verse 1. And we're looking at these prayers. Now, the, the prayers that are offered, these would have to include the prayers that we just read about in chapter 6, aren't they? How much longer? Right. But notice how they did this. If we go back to um, if we go back to chapter six and we look at verse ten, notice how they prayed. How did they do it? Look at the look at the phrase here. They cried with a loud voice. Cried out. Yes, they cried out with a loud voice. You get the, do you get the uh, sense of desperation, yeah, urgency, urgency, hurt, pain, anger, frustration? I don't know what they're feeling, but it's all righteous. But all those emotions are there and it's passionate. There's, you almost, you get a real heart in it. It wasn't one of these, you know, sometimes when we pray, we feel like, and sometimes we kind of, drift into a, a pattern, a rhythm, a voice rhythm, where we kind of keep the same kind of rhythm. Lord, would you please show us what the day is that the time is going to be until you avenge us. It, 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 where, there, where we kind of take our heart out of it, we take our passion out of it and move it aside because we think that, that some, somewhere in here we've been conditioned to think that 
we've got to pray. When we talk to God, we can only talk to him in certain terms, in certain tones. But here they cry out with a loud voice to the Lord. But, they, but the prayer is, how long, O oh Lord? But notice here the reverence. You are holy. You are true. And then the response is it also, you are the one who judges and you're the one who avenges our blood. You know, we, we, we know that you're going to avenge our blood. We know that you're the one who's judging. So here's this prayer. It, it's reverent. It's responsive. And then there's a request. And they want to know how long. It's a valid request. God doesn't. Notice that God doesn't say, you're not supposed to ask how long. He, they're told to wait. You just have to wait. So if you keep that in mind, that, and, and for me, I think, and I mentioned this on Sunday, especially on our common grounds, I think that's probably one of the biggest struggles, at least that I have in my own prayer life, is when God tells me to wait. And sometimes he doesn't tell that to me in certain words, but everything that's happening around me is saying, you got to wait, you got to wait. And I think it's one of the hardest things to do for me anyway. I don't know. Does anybody else have trouble struggles with waiting? Anybody Absolutely. get a hand, get a witness there. Rest yeah. of it. Exactly. You're fine. You don't mind waiting. That's good. Me, I, I, I struggle with it. I struggle with it. Okay. So, so we look at chapter eight and, and as we go back here to, to this passage, God's got the prayers. He's given the prayers to this angel because they were on the altar. And so now the angel's directed. He's taken the incense. He's taken the prayers. He's got them in the censer. And he's going to offer it up before the uh, on the golden altar. And notice in verse 4, the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So guess who her, hears these prayers? God does. And, and honestly, I wonder if the scene is that much different now as it will be then in the, fu in the future. Do our prayers ascend up to, to God in heaven as like sweet incense now? I would have to think they do. It, it, so, so that means something that when we pray, it's not an exercise in futility. It's not an exercise so that we can check a box and say, yes, I, I've done my, my God thing or my spiritual thing. It's something much more than that. It, it's coming to the, the one creator of the universe and it rises up like incense, like a sweet aroma that delights him. And that's why you, I, I, in my message, I talked about the fact that God loves it when we pray, even though he already knows what we're going to say, even though he already knows what we need, he loves it when we pray. Because that is the thing that's going to move us onto the place where he can speak to us and reveal himself to us. And so, so notice this, that he brings the, 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 the prayers ascend up to God. And now notice what God, the angel does. He takes it takes the censer and fills it with fire from the altar and throws it to the earth and notice that there's noises and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So the very same censer that had the incense and had the prayers of the saints apparently is empty. It's all emptied out. And so notice now what the, what the censer's filled with. According to verse five, what's it filled with now? Fire from the altar. Fire from the altar. Now, can you uh, can you think of another incident, uh, 
in scripture, another example in scripture where the prayers went up and the fire came down. Elijah. Elijah. Elijah called the fire from heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you, you see that fire. So the fire there points to what? The prayer sacrifice. Well, even bigger than this, even bigger than this, this, the prayers and the incense ascended up to before God. And now the censer is filled with fire. Answers to God's, prayer. God's going to work. Yeah. He's going to work. And so now notice after that, that the seven angels who had the seven trumpets line up. So as soon as this angel throws the fire to the earth, the seven angels line up. Now, here's something that, that, that's, that, that it gets even greater with this. We go a little further. We go to chapter 9. Go to chapter 9 and verse 13. Yeah. Chapter 9, verse 13. Okay, so in chapter 9... We, we go through trumpet one, two, three, four, and five. And now we're at, in verse 13, where it's trumpet number six. Okay. Trumpet number six says the sixth angel, verse 13, the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Now notice that it's the altar again. Same altar where the angel got the fire and threw it to the earth that caused the angels to line up indication god's going to work so now this so now same altar same golden altar which is before god where the where the uh, where the offering was put up and where the fire came from now you hear a voice so whose voice is this Who, whose voice do you think that we're hearing if you look at chapter 9 verse 13 it's a voice from the four horns of the golden altar who might that be probably going to be the same God who owns the altar don't you think yes so, so, so here you've got the gold, the, this voice, and the voice from the golden altar is speaking. To hear it, Okay, and so uh, we're we're taking a look at this, and and uh, as we do, um, as we look at this, it says. The voice says to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, verse four, 14, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, notice this in verse 15, the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year. Now, this opens up a whole new kettle of fish because these four angels are not angels, I don't think, in the pure sense of the word. Because angels don't need to be bound. Yeah, I was wondering that too. They don't need to be bound. So these are, I don't want to, I'm going to stop short of calling them demons because I don't think they are because that's a specific word. But they are not ones that are in heaven but they rather are satanic in their service. And so they're bound up in the, uh, there at the great river Euphrates. But it's interesting to note that even as they have been in rebellion against God, that they have been prepared for the hour and day and month and year to go and kill a third of mankind. So these are angels that are that are bad. They're, they're angels that are rebellious. And yet, even in their badness and their rebellion, 
God has prepared them and set them aside for this precise moment that he was going to use them to eliminate a third of humanity. Now that, now that sounds rather harsh, doesn't it? It sounds rather cruel that God would, you know, set aside four beings uh, for the specific purpose of, of taking away life and, and billions of, of lives as it were. It sounds really harsh, but remember that this is the answer to the prayers back in chapter six. This is part of the answer to, to those prayers. How much longer are you going to wait till you avenge us? Well, here it is, verse in chapter nine, you, that we're going to start to see, we're starting to see even more of that. Okay. But I want you to, but, but notice here the precision and the planning. I mean, God has all the details planned as to how he is going to execute wrath. I mean, if, if you think about it, uh, when, when you consider it, God could eliminate humanity any number of different ways. Any number of different ways. But rather here, though, he's doing so in a very methodical manner. It's very methodical. It's very processed and very thought out. And the reason I, that, that I say that is that um, when you look here at the results of this, of this sixth trumpet, look down here with me on the screen of verse 20. He says, John writes, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons or idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, neither see, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So why does God take only 33% of, of humanity here? Give the others a chance to uh, give them another opportunity. Come to Jesus, if you will. <laughs> yeah. This is this is literally a come to Jesus moment, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And they don't take advantage of it. And, and, and instead, they they become even more obstinate. Even though the world's burning up all around them, they're even more obstinate and rebellious with this and so here again here is god's uh, his knowledge he knows they're going to be more adamant and they're going to refuse he knows that that is going to be the case but yet because he's a god of mercy he says one more chance and they say no they say no now let's go and look at another passage and we'll skip ahead now to the next set of judgments, which is the seven bowls of judgment. Now, the seven bowls of judgment are all contained in the seventh trumpet. Okay, so, so follow. remember, follow that line of seven seals of judgment. Seal number seven has the seven trumpets. And then trumpet number seven has the seven bowls. Okay, so in it, those three sevens, wrap up the completeness of God's judgment upon all of creation. Now, the thing about the bowls is that where the trumpets got started, the bowls finished it up. Okay, so let's look at this and, and take a look at some of this again. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. Now, I want to stop right there and take a look at that again. And notice the loud voice says this to the seven angels that line up with the plagues and the bull. He says, go. All right. Now it's ready, set, go. It's time. It's time to pull it, pour out the bowls uh, of the wrath of God. And so now the bowls are being poured out. And where the, the trumpets went 33%, the bowls go 100%. And, and every one of them 
is it has been ordered now from God. God has given the word and said, go, go, go. And, and they, they go and do it. And again, I want, I, I want to point out the connection between all of this and the prayers here of these saints. How much longer, Lord? So apparently by, by the time of the seventh bowl, the, the seven bowls, the number of the people who are going to lose their lives for following Jesus Christ has reached its, its pinnacle. It's reached its completion. And so now God is beginning the judgment upon the earth. And even more people are going to be eliminated. So, so the thing I really wanted to, to point out tonight with this is the, the, the connection of prayer to all of this. And to ask the question, if, if prayer is so powerful that God will use the prayers of these saints in connection with the greatest of all judgments upon the earth, if he's doing that here, what do you think he does with our prayer right now? And, and I, I want to ask with this, you know, has it occurred to you that your prayer, every one of your prayers goes up and is noticed by God? And it's received by God and he hears it. And, and, and so when you, when you know that that's the case, how does that affect your waiting? Because all too often, we don't get instant answers, do we? No. So how does that, how does knowing that affect your waiting? Well, we just have to be patient and, and wait, see what the Lord's going to do for us. Okay, what if that waiting turns into years, to decades? I guess sometimes it does. Okay, so how do we, how do we best deal with the waiting? Is that something you struggle with? Absolutely. How do you deal with it? How do you cope? in the waiting how what what do what do you learn in how to wait more effectively what goes into that i don't know but i do learn to wait more effectively <laughs> i know there's nothing i can do to make it go faster so you know what i do is i dig into the word okay more you know, because there is nothing else. What do. Do you, when you do that, what do you look for specifically? What passages are you looking for? I'm not so much looking for passages, but um, but I, you know, now that you got me thinking about it, I, what I am reading, I'm focusing on the character of God. Okay. If we truly believe, like you said, that God hears our prayers, and just like it shows in Revelations how they're there, then we should say, who are we to question? You know, his, he's going to answer, but who are we to, how, who are we to question? It's, as humans, it's hard to be patient. But then when you think, if you really truly believe that, then who are we to question God? Because he always knows what's best for us learning process though yeah yeah i go back to um one of the songs that the lord brought to me while nick was sick and it was about it's it's called king of the world and it's about who am i to put god in this little box that he should operate only in my little box. <laughs> yeah. 
I've been reading a book by Pete Scazzaro. And in it, he talks about this very issue. And, and he talks about this in terms, he calls it a wall. He, he refers to St. John of the Cross who wrote, he, he was a, a, a minister who wrote 1500 years ago. And St. John of the Cross calls it the dark night of the soul. Maybe you've heard of, of, of that as well, where it seems as though God seems a million miles away and our prayers are not working. We're not seeing God at work. We're, we're, we're missing that. And it seems like we're all alone sometimes and we're by ourselves and, and, and we can't get a hold of God. You know, we can't get, we can't, we can't grasp him. We can't get close to him. You know, those are some of the things that we struggle with. And, and in the, his books, Cazero talks about two things that occur in when, he, when you get into that season. And one, he talks about a, a greater awareness of our brokenness. And I think you kind of touch on that a little bit when you say, Deb, who am I? to question God. You know, <laughs> I, I have no business trying to tell God how to be God. I don't have any business doing that. But yet at the same time, I'm coming, I'm going to be real with my feelings and my emotion, but I can't help it because I'm broken. And it just, you know, I know I shouldn't be like this, but I am. And that, that kind of brings out an even greater awareness of my own personal brokenness. And then second, with that brokenness, there's a greater awareness of what Scazzaro calls the divine mystery. And he terms it kind of like this. The more I study and the more I get to know of God, the more I realize how little I know of him. And, and when we think that we've got him figured out and, and that the Lord works like this and this and this and this and only like this and this and this and this, uh, it, it, we, we set ourselves up for hitting one of those walls because he's not bound by that. He's not limited to that. Yes, he's going to stay in conformance with scripture and we can hold on to that. But in those moments where he's telling us to wait or he's, we're, we're, we're met with silence. When we put both of those together, a greater awareness of our brokenness and a greater awareness of how, how big he is. And again, that's kind of what you were talking about, Angie, the, where you went to scripture, you made God bigger. When we, be, when we get to those two points, we are in a better position to wait on it. Both of those factors in our hearts and our minds get us to a point where we can wait on him and while it's still not fun to wait on him both of those things bring out that capacity to say i'm willing to wait because i need to know more about you i'm willing to wait because i realize how broken i am and i need you to fix me and so with regard to the thing that I'm praying about, maybe it's the occasion for you to fix me, whatever it is that you want to fix. And maybe it's an occasion for me to know you more deeply, part even more of this great mystery that I don't understand. Maybe this is the occasion to get me deeper with you and to, to get things fixed in me, part of that good work that you've begun in me, in order to more effectively wait. And this example, I think that we see here in Revelation, uh, that, that God is very methodical. He's right on schedule with what he's intending to do with us. He's not in a hurry, but he's not late. It, but again, I think it's one of the great challenges that we have in in walking with Christ is that waiting period, isn't it? So I don't know. What do you think about that? Does that give you some other things to chew on? 
Yeah, for sure. Learning, learning to wait is such a um, learning process. And if God answered us right away on everything, there would be no trust. And um, I don't know, I just, it wouldn't be good if we got our answers right away because it's such a teaching moment in our lives of growing time when God has us wait and trust him. It increases our trust. Yeah. And when we can look back and see, oh yeah, Lord, you knew I was being impatient. I wanted it to be that way, but now I see why you waited, you know. Then you go next time you'll say, oh, okay, and got it. You had it then. You're, you didn't fail me then. You're not gonna fail me now. It just increases your faith. Yeah, I find it, it, it it's so interesting when you read Philippians chapter four, and you know. We, there, there's a lot of things that we quote in chapter four of Philippians, you know, um, the, 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 13. The, the, yes, 13 is the one that everybody loves to quote. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and, and 19 and, and 19, my God shall supply all your needs. Uh, right. you know, we, we, we go in and we quote those, but we quote them out of context. Um, it, it, because Verse 13 ends a remarkable statement that Paul gives to the Philippian church. Listen to this. He says, finally, Brett, he, he says in, in verse six, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue or if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate deeply on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do and the God of peace will be with you. Now notice here in, in verse nine, Paul tells the Philippians, the things which you learned from me. So get that word learning. Okay. It didn't come to them automatically. It didn't come to them naturally. They had to learn these things, which was to, instead of worrying, pray. In, instead of worrying, give thanks. Instead of worrying, take those worries and let them leave them to God so that the peace of God can guard their hearts. And instead, focus your mind on the things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report. Okay, so, so there's this key that you've got. That's what you have to do while you're waiting. Okay, instead of being anxious, bring it to God and then focus on the things that you know. And, and man, there's a, just a, you can go deeper into each of those words of true and noble and just, and, and suddenly you've got a whole new set of things that you put your mind on. And that's what you focus your mind on. But here's how this goes. Notice this in verse 10, he says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And the key phrase there, don't, to not miss, I had to learn to be content in whatever state. Contentment did not come automatically. It didn't come just because now I'm a believer, I'm content in Jesus and everything's all great because I have Jesus. He had to learn this. And notice how he had to do it. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. I know how to be knocked down low. And I know how to have more than enough. He says, I know in everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So in order to learn how to, to be content, he had to learn how to be full. So in order to learn how to be full, he had to be full. He had to learn how to be content when he was hungry. And in order to be content when you're hungry, you got to be hungry. And now, because of that, I learned this. And the way I learned this and how I learned how to be content and how to endure the hard times 
and to keep a good perspective on the good, good times and endure the bad times is through Christ. And I can do all that through Christ who, who strengthens me. And so it's really remarkable how that fits into waiting on the Lord, doesn't it? Because while you wait, you've got to learn how to be content. You know, I'm looking at Paul and Silas when they were in jail in Philippi. Uh -huh. And they were rejoicing and praising God, regardless of their circumstances. And finally, okay. God sent his angel and opened the whole place up. Yeah, yeah. But don't you find that fascinating that Paul says he had to learn this? Didn't just come automatically. There was a learning curve. Yeah, even for somebody like Paul. You know, we look at Paul and, and think that, you know, he he didn't he didn't have any struggles, you know, spiritually speaking, uh, the moment he came to Christ. But he had nothing but struggles. He had nothing but struggles. And so he struggled with the very same things that we struggle with. And so I, 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 it, I think it's such a valuable lesson that we see illustrated here in revelation this idea of waiting on the lord and while we wait to learn how to be content in christ and that status that never changes and it's a great it, it, it it's a great discipline you know if if this is something that you struggle with if this is something that that um you, uh, kind of makes you frustrated this is a great study to go in and look at this philippians 4 passage and especially in verse 8 you know if you if you already know verse 7 you know i'm supposed to pray and i know you know you're supposed to give thanks and you're supposed to bring all these requests to god all right now that you've done that now what then you come to verse 8 you got to fit you got to think deeply on the things that are true well, for instance, what do we know is true? We know God is true. We know God's word is true. We know that what God says is true. You know, those are things. God, you are true. Jesus, you are, said you are the truth. Lord, I praise you because you are the truth. See how that works? And then again, the word for noble has the idea of reverence. It's not just something you know, a noble steed, it's reverent. It's something that, that uh, you talk about that uh, somebody possesses that no one else does. It's a really great study to go deeper and deeper. If that's, if waiting is one of those things that is a challenge for you and being content with where you are right now is a, is a challenge for you. A good study. So that's what I wanted to point out tonight as we looked at chapter eight. Do you guys, do, do, do any of you have anything else to add or any other observations or, or something else you want to share with us tonight? Love to hear it. You might have to unmute yourself before you speak. Well, I just think it brings up the, the power and importance of prayer there's really is power in it so it, it should encourage us to continue praying yes yes it sure does it sure does pray without ceasing don't quit don't give up on it so jim did you get yourself unmuted took the video yes. off there you go oh. Finally, well, uh, at my age, uh, I see things a lot different than I did 20 years ago, like you all. And I, I, I can wait because uh, I'm waiting for that day that he calls me, that's all. Uh, I have more to do every day than I have time for. And when I, don't, when I, when I just uh, come to the end of my energy, I just sit down and rest. I have no trouble with resting. I'm not lazy. 
I just I don't have the energy. Uh, I'm not sure I'm making myself clear, but uh, I, I don't feel like I'm waiting on anything okay. other than, other than th that day. Uh, I've done everything I wanted to do, uh, which is, and the things I didn't get to do, I don't want to do now. So <laughs> I, that's, that's pretty big, isn't it? But well, that's me. Oh, I get it. I get it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Anyone else? Well, I hope that that's of help to you. I hope as you as you read that that passage there in in chapter eight of Revelation that. Um, the Lord uses that to, to enrich your, your prayer time with him, your time alone with him. And just to know that uh, every, every prayer we offer up and every time we spend seeking his face, we find him because of the fact that we're in Christ. Uh, that's, that's automatic because we've been adopted. We're, brand, we're adopted kids of his. And so he's, he is always going to hear us our challenge is getting positioned to where we can hear him. And so if we can keep that in mind that we need to be ready to adjust and, and ready to let him work in our hearts and our lives to, to bring us to the place where we, we hear him and we see him working around us, then we're in great condition. So, so let's keep that in mind as we make, continue to make him known. And then I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and, and share this link with others when you get it.